Hi, my name's Matt Filder, and this is Evangelism course at Southern Cross College. It is part of the Cert 4 in ministry, and it goes for 14 weeks. And today we're starting with why evangelism? Well, this week we're going to talk about our motivation, personal evangelism, and salt of the earth. What is our motivation? Well, we have the highest motivation. It comes from the Trinity themselves. God the Father was the supreme evangelist. He was the most passionate about reaching this generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Son of God, he was the passionate one that came here, more passionate about people than anybody else that's ever walked the face of the earth. In fact, he said, don't get excited because people get delivered or set free and healed. He said, get more excited that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is here to help us, encourage us, strengthen us and lead us into encounters with people that are yet to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. Personal evangelism, I believe most people are brought to faith through the loving persistence and friendship of someone close to them, a spouse, be it a friend or a family member. That's the way God uses us to reach a generation. Today I want to talk to you about salt of the earth. See friends, have you ever thought about the names that God has called us? You know, he says names like mighty man of God, mighty man of valor. He calls us conquerors, overcomers, saints, priests. Jesus is known as the king of kings. We're called kings. Now imagine how it's there to make you feel. Imagine how it made Simon feel. Remember the story where the boys had just come back from preaching and Jesus meets up with them and he says, men, tell me, who do men say that I am? And they began to say stuff like, well, some say you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're a prophet, some say you're a sharp dresser, nice car, good hairstyle. But then Jesus turned around and he said this, he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon looked at him and he said, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you the truth, upon this rock of revelation that you've had, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And you'll no longer be called Simon, but you will be called Peter the Rock. Now imagine how Peter felt when he had his name transformed. I imagine his chest puffing up. I imagine him looking around at the rest of the disciples going, I'm Peter, I'm the Rock. I imagine him calling out, Yo, Adrian. See, there was something that happened in his life when his name was changed and God understood the significance of names. See, names had significance in the Bible. Ruth meant friend of God. John meant sent from God. Matthew meant gift from God. Josiah means fire of God. I think about it even when my daughters were born. I had the privilege of living with three of the most beautiful women that have ever been created on this planet. And I remember when my youngest daughter was born, we didn't find out what gender she was because we liked the element of surprise, you see. And I remember when my wife went into labor, she was doing all the hard work and I was there just encouraging. But I remember that point when the baby was born that uh, I, I, I was trying to find out what gender is it? What gender is this baby? And I'm trying to push the nurses out the way, the midwife out the way, but they had to do what they needed to do. But then sooner or later I saw it, they moved the umbilical cord and I could tell it was a girl. And we knew immediately her name was to be called Isabel which means is beautiful in Italian. And when you see her, she's drop dead gorgeous. See names, they have incredible significance. And today I want to look at a name that goes far beyond any other name we have been called. I want to look at a name that I believe if you were to grab a hold of it, you would understand why it's evangelism. You would understand the significance of what Jesus was talking about. And it's found in Matthew chapter five. This is just after Jesus has preached the Beatitudes. He's been speaking, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the merciful. He's beginning to speak to a crowd, a congregation, if you like. And at the end of the Beatitudes, we see Jesus, he turns and he says this in Matthew 5, verse 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Now I've got to ask you this question, why, after all the fantastic names, does Jesus reduce us to a condiment? Saint, priest, overcomer, mighty man of God, salt. 
Why, after all those fantastic names, does he pull us down to something that sits on the table in a plastic container that hardly ever gets used? See, I don't know about you, but what comes to mind when you think of the word salt? I think of things like high blood pressure. I think of that evil product that's been made by the devil called Dutch licorice. It is the foulest tasting stuff I've ever had in my life. I think of uh, uh, heart disease. I think of fluid retention. I think of it stings when it gets into your eyes. I, I, I think of that beautiful uh, little old fish and chip shop lady that you used to go down the shop and order your $2 of chips. And then you, she'd say, would you like some salt? And you say, yeah, just a little bit. And she'd pull out this canister with a million holes in it and then begin to flood the whole table with this massive white powder. And you suddenly discovered that you had to ask for some potato with your salt. That's what I think about when I think of the name salt. I remember when Jesus said, imagine him on the mountain. He said, you are the salt of the earth. And when he said that, a whole bunch of the crowd jumped back in fear. And he said, and you're the chicken salt. Okay, no, he didn't say that. See, so why after all the great names did he call us salt? Well, today we're going to look at four reasons. I believe there are many other reasons, but for this course, we're going to look at four reasons of why Jesus called us salt. And I believe if you grab a hold of them, they will change the way you see evangelism. Now, what I'm about to say may shock some people. So listen, if you're with a friend, just comfort them right now. I know this is going out and people are going to be watching us on DVD, so just be with them and care for them at this point in time because what I'm about to say is going to, it's going to upset some people. See, because I wasn't always a Christian. Okay, you're, you're okay? Good, good. See, I know some of you look and think, well, this guy has got to be, must have been super Christian. He must have been like Gabriel personified. Well, I appreciate your love and support, but the truth of the matter is, I wasn't always a Christian. Now, before I was a Christian, I used to go to another place every weekend, just like I do now I go to church. I used to hang out with my friends at this place, just like I do at church on the weekends now. Uh, I even used to get drunk in the spirit, kind of like a lot of people do at church these days. Sometimes I get so full of the spirit that I would fall down under the power of the spirit, which is amazing, really, kind of like some people do at church these days. Some people would even say that under the influence of the spirit, I would speak in new languages, which is amazing. And I certainly loved everybody. Now, I know some of you have worked out what I'm talking about here. and I know for others that don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the pub. It was a place that I used to frequent every weekend before I became a Christian. And I began to think back to this when I thought about the salt of the earth, because I used to remember, and I just want you to go with me on this journey. Uh, if you've never been there, just, just listen to the words I say. But I remember as I used to go along to these pubs, the one thing I would do is I would order a drink. And not only would the barman bring me a drink, but then he would also bring over a bowl full of peanuts or, or, or sometimes potato chips. Other times it was pretzels. And he would give them to me and they were free. And so I'd say, well, thank you very much. And I remember as I'd be drinking my drink, I'd take a handful of these peanuts or a handful of these chips, a handful of these pretzels, and I'd shove them in my mouth. And I've got to tell you, something you discover as you're eating these chips or these pretzels or these nuts is once you start, you can't stop. But what I found is as the bowl began to get emptier and emptier, the barman would come and he would fill up the bowl again for nothing. But what I began to discover after a few moments of eating these nuts after a few moments of eating these potato chips, after a few minutes of eating these pretzels, I began to discover one thing, that these pretzels are making me thirsty. And I began to think about when Jesus said, you're called to be the salt of the earth, it is because we are called to create a thirst in people's lives. So number one reason why Jesus called us to be the salt of the earth is because salt creates thirst. Now, let me tell you, friends, see, God, wherever he was walking around as Jesus Christ, created a thirst in people's lives. I want you to understand, wherever he was, the Bible tells us that crowds thronged him. If he met in a person's house, they would dig a hole through the roof trying to get to him. As he's walking down the Via Della Rosa, it says that crowds were jamming in, so much so that a woman had to try and push through the crowd to get near Jesus Christ. There was something about him that made people want what he had. They got thirsty for what they had. When you look at John chapter 4, it's a story about the woman at the well. 
Jesus goes there in the middle of the day and this woman comes in the middle of the day also because she's living an adulterous life and she gets ridiculed in the morning when everybody else is drawing water. So she comes in the middle of the day where Jesus is sitting at the well. She comes to draw water and Jesus begins to start a conversation with her and immediately it gets her attention. She begins to ask question after question after question. Why? Because Jesus was creating a thirst in her. She began to get thirsty for what he had. I want to ask you this question. Do people feel like that when they come in contact with you? Do they get thirsty for what you've got? There's more stories. If you flick back just a page from Matthew chapter 5, we can see the story in Matthew 4 verse 18. It says this, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in the boat with their father Zebedee, preparing the nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Think about the impact. We read this as such a simple story, but just a few words that Jesus speaks out create such a thirst in these men that they leave their livelihood, they leave their occupation. This uh, that James and John left their father and went and followed him. Jesus didn't yell out and say, boys, what's your dad paying you? And they said, well, 20,000 shekels. And he goes, well, I'll up it by 10,000 shekels. I'll give you a company car, mobile phone, four weeks annual leave. Come follow me. No, no. All he said was, come follow me. And they got up they left their occupation and they followed him. Jesus had the ability to create a thirst in people. What about you? What do you stir in people's lives? When you come into contact with them, do they get thirsty for what you've got? Or see, so many times as Christians, we, le we can leave bad tastes in people's mouths. But God has called us to create a thirst in people's lives. So number one, salt creates thirst. And secondly is this. I've I, I got to admit, I love cooking. One thing I love to do is I love to cook. Whenever I get the chance, I, I, I like to create. I've got this big cast iron wok and uh, I, I just like to go crazy with it. You know, I love watching cooking shows. Jamie Oliver is one of my heroes at this point of time. He just throws everything in a pan and it just looks so good. I, I remember one time, it's, it's bad for me to watch cooking shows because it makes me get hungry. Yeah, I remember one time I was on a fast. It was a Daniel fast and I was eating vegetables only and I discovered at that point that I make a lousy vegetarian. I only like vegetables when they're wrapped in meat, you understand? But I remember this one time in particular, I was about 21 days into a Daniel fast, and this cooking show came on where they were cooking this unbelievable roast. I gotta tell you, I could smell the roast coming out of the television screen. I believe my wife actually caught me licking the television screen. It was quite embarrassing, but there you go. But you know, I remember one time I was watching this cooking show, and I'm watching Jeff Jans on the show called Fresh. And he's grabbing all these ingredients, you know. He's, he's pulling in all these different things and he's sticking them into this pot. And once he finished putting all these different things into the pot, he said this amazing thing. He said, now just for a pinch of salt to bring out the flavour. And I began to think to myself again. When Jesus called us to be the salt of the earth, number one, salt creates thirst. But number two, salt brings out the flavour of life. Whenever Jesus was around, he brought out the flavor of life. When he got us to be the salt of the earth, it was because he wanted us to bring out the flavor of life. John 10.10 10 says this, the thief comes only to steal, to kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and life more abundant. Jesus was into spicing up life. That word means superabundant, abounding quantity and quality of life. Let me tell you, friends, to be a Christian means to be the most alive a human being can ever be. I don't believe Christianity is boring. I believe if you think Christianity is boring, you need to get saved because you gave your life to the wrong God. When you give your life over to Jesus Christ, he brings out life. He is the creator of life and he knows how to spice it up. Friends, see, so when Jesus called us to be the salt of the earth, it was because we were called to spice up life. Now, I've got to admit, right, I, I, I have a weakness. It's called hot chips. I don't care where you get them from. As long as they're hot and they're fresh, I love them. But a confession I need to make is this. I used to have my chips 
without salt because I thought that was healthier. So deep fry the potato, but don't put salt on it because I want good health. You understand? I remember, you know, I mean, how many people here have ever tried a potato with no salt on it? You get one of those hot chips, you put it in your mouth, and your mouth immediately rejects it. It is like, I don't want you in here. Your tongue starts saying, don't even lay on me. Your teeth are sitting there going, don't even come here. I'm not chewing you. And your tonsils are kind of going like this. There's no way you're entering here. Your stomach will vomit it back up. It is the most boring, unexcited vegetable. But I've got to tell you, friends, when you put salt on that thing, you turn a Clark Kent potato into super fry. You understand, when you put that salt on that chip, you put it in your mouth, your tongue does the wartusi. Your teeth are calling out, come here, come here, I want to chew. Your tonsils are going, bring it on. And your stomach's kind of singing, what about me? It's freaking out. It wants to get a taste of what the tongue is experiencing. See, that's what salt does. It spices up bland. It brings flavor. It brings the flavor out of life. Everywhere, think about it, everywhere Jesus was, he spiced up life. Everywhere. You wanted this man everywhere. He was big at weddings because if you ran out of Pepsi Max, he would just simply say, fill the bathtub up, he'd pray over it and you'd dip a cup in and it'd be the best Pepsi Max you've ever tasted in your life. You wanted Jesus at your funerals because you didn't have him. You'd go to a viewing, Jesus would walk in and go, Get up in my name and the person would get up and it would become a party, no longer a funeral. See, friends, Jesus spiced up life. You wanted him walking through a hospital ward. I love this story in Matthew 8, verse 14 to 15. It says this, when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on him. Now, I need you to think about this. You imagine this. Jesus is walking along with his disciples and he goes, I'm feeling a bit peckish. I I, I need some food. And Peter says, well, my house is down the road, but my mother-in-law is there, but she's sick, so she can't do anything. And he goes, no worries, I'll fix that. So they go into the house. He walks into the bedroom. He sees her laying there sick. He goes, how are you, lady? She goes, oh, I'm not feeling too well. He goes, well, I'll fix that. Rise up in my name. And she gets up. She's healed instantly. He goes, now, can you fix us some food? I'm starving. How good is God? Wouldn't it be amazing that we could walk around spicing up life and changing people's lives in an encounter like that? See, friends, the Bible says this. Jesus lived for 33 years when he walked on the face of the earth. He's still alive now. But the Bible also tells us that he had three years of ministry. And John, at the end of his book, says this, I suppose that if all the things that Jesus did were written down, not even the books of the earth could contain the miracles that he performed. See, in the three years that he used ministry, in the 33 years that he was alive, he challenged more moral issues, he impacted more lives, he healed more people, he delivered more who were oppressed, he changed more lives than any other man who's ever walked the face of the earth, and he's still doing it today, 2,000 years later. That is a man that knew what it was to bring out the flavor of life. See, friends, people recognize the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is used as a swear word in most places. People strike their thumb with a... Uh, with a hammer and they yell out, Jesus Christ. Now, why do they mention that name? Because there is some sort of power and authority in that name. See, if you strike your thumb with a hammer and go, Matt Fielder, that's got nothing. But when you mention the name of Jesus Christ, it changes atmospheres. See, what people don't understand is they recognize there's power in that name. They just don't recognize the power that is in that name. Jesus spiced up life in 33 years. Not even the books of the earth could contain all that Jesus did. Friends, I've been alive for 42 years. You could write my whole life history on an A5 piece of paper folded several times with room for pictures and autographs and you still have some blank space for notes. Friends, this is a man that changed the world. He spiced up life. So number one, salt creates thirst. Number two, salt brings out the flavor. And number three, salt preserves. I remember many years ago, I had the privilege of going to India. And uh, we were down in southern India, all in different areas, Hyderabad, Amalapuram, uh, uh, Vizag, Madras, all these amazing places. They were incredible places. And I remember having the greatest experience of my life. But one of the things that really impacted me was I was in this little village 
where I was watching this man beating the life out of some meat. And I kind of thought to myself, number one, what did the meat do to him? But number two, as I watched him beating this meat profoundly, beating it flat, then I was watching him put it into a box. So I went up to him and I said, what are you doing? And he said this, he goes, well, this meat is getting uh, uh, packaged and it's going across a, about a three or four hour journey. Uh, but in the sun, in the intense sun, it could go off. So what we're doing is we're beating it flat. We're putting it in this box. And when I looked in the box, he says, you'll see on the bottom of the box, there's salt. And he said, we're putting the meat across this salt and then we're putting more salt on top of it, packing it down, then more meat, more salt, more meat, more salt. And I said, well, what's the purpose of that? He said, see, the salt will stop the meat from going off. And I began to think to myself again, when Jesus called us to be the salt of the earth, it is because we are called to preserve life. This world is morally decaying. It is going off, so to speak. See, friends, I've got to be honest with you. If I wasn't a Christian and I didn't believe in Jesus Christ, I would definitely be a greenie trying to save this planet because it is slowly decaying. It is slowly destroying itself. But see, Jesus called us to be salt because he wanted us to preserve life. This world is dying morally. It's dying socially. It's dying economically. And now we're accepting things today that we would have never accepted. The change in climate on television is absolutely amazing. Words that were never allowed to be used on television are now being used after 8.30 at night. We've got reality TV shows that are showing real crime scenes, real deaths, real murders, and we've become insular to them. We've allowed them to just come in. We watch the news today, there's never any good news. And we just accept it because bad news seems to sell. But Jesus wanted us to bring in good news. Never once do you turn on the television and read or hear the newsreader saying, good news today, Mrs. Jones got her lawn mowed by Mr. Smith for nothing. That's not the news item. News item is this. Bad news today, Mrs. Jones was hacked to death by Mr. Smith and his lawnmower and she's left in the catcher. That's what sells these days. You understand? See, we've got, a, we've got a society that is slowly decaying. We've got road rage now is acceptable. I, I remember experiencing road rage firsthand myself. One time when we were driving home from a prayer meeting, a uh, little girl was asleep in the back of the car and I remember getting cut off by this gentleman in a BMW. And uh, I remember, so what I did is I just gently flashed him with my lights just to let him acknowledge him. And uh, so he pulled down, he slowed down, and then he swerved at us and almost hit us again. I thought, what's wrong with this guy? So immediately, I'm a spiritual man. I began to pray, God, turn the lights red at the traffic lights because I would like to witness to him. I would like to minister to him. And you know what? God surely answered my prayer. The lights turned red. But my wife knew what was going on here. And she began to say, don't get out the car. Don't you get out the car. Don't you say anything. You're a man of God. You're a Christian. You're supposed to behave. Don't get out the car. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you know when you get so angry that your pulse begins to beat in your neck. My back begins to twitch. I'm gripping the steering wheel. I'm like, <sighs> and you know what? Like I said, God answered the prayer. He turned the lights red. So now I know I'm going to have fellowship with my brother in the BMW. So anyway, we pull up alongside the set of lights. There he is, and I start winding down my window, and he presses the button. Bzzz. As I'm about to say something, the gentleman says, is there something wrong with you, old boy? Now, I've got to be honest with you. I, you know, he's not my friend. He doesn't have the right to call me old boy. So I'm just about to say, well, and even before I got a word out, my wife yells from across the way. She goes, I've got a baby in the back. You turkey! Now she yelled so hard, it blew my hair off, right? When I looked around, she was manifesting. She had fangs out. I mean, you don't mess with a new mum. You understand? And this guy in the BMW, he just took off. That was road rage, my first experience. My wife gave me a demonstration of what it is to get so angry you could rip someone apart. But see, friends, we have accepted that as part of life. We've accepted it. We've got young kids being violated in schools by other young kids. And it's all put under uh, learning disorders and different things like this. See, friends, we're living in a generation where it's scary to, to help someone that's broken down on the side of the road for fear that they're going to mug you. You know, we'd say if chivalry's dead. No, kindness is dead. People don't do any acts of kindness for anybody anymore for fear of being beaten, mugged, or something else going on. That's the type of society we've gone in. But Jesus called us to preserve moral decay. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever noticed that people stop swearing around you? 
You never said anything to, to them, but they stopped swearing around you. Why is that? Because you're changing the moral decay. See, the Bible is full of people that change moral decay. In Jonah 3, and three, uh, th verse 3 to 10, it talks about Jonah getting sent to Nineveh and by the power of his words, saving a city. God is into changing the moral decay. In the Welsh revival, back in the early 19th century, 200,000 people got saved in just over two years. Such was the impact over in Wales that pubs closed down. Rugby games were delayed. Police, it's reported, became bored because the crime rate went down by 75%. See, let me tell you, when real Christianity has an effect in a community, it preserves the moral decay. One of the funniest stories I read about the Welsh Revival was the miners were having problems working because the donkeys that pulled the court, uh, carts didn't understand their new cleaned up language. You imagine this, the donkey was used to the miner going, get your beep, 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 beep. And the donkey were like, oh, and move on. But all of a sudden, these miners are getting saved. Their language is getting cleaned up. And so they'd be walking back to work going, saying, I say, you hairy fellow, why don't you get on and giddy up? And the donkeys are like, I don't understand what's going on. They went on strike. That's a real thing. That's what, that's what happens when God begins to change a society. One of the privileges I had as a minister was going over to South America uh, to a place just outside of Argentina called La Plata at a prison, a maximum security prison. 2,400 prisoners at the time that I went there back in 1997, 1,200 of them were born again. These were maximum security. They were lifers. Most of them were in there for the rest of their life. Mass murderers, rapists, major gangsters, yet half of the prison had become born again. The impact on them was so, hard, uh, was so hardcore that they went from 130 prison guards to 30 prison guards. I remember being invited into there to go to a, and hold a service. And as I'm walking, I remember walking through these, these jail cell blocks, making our way to the main compound. And I thought that I was a rough looking guy. I thought I was pretty tough. But I remember walking down these jail cell blocks and there were these mean looking guys just grabbing hold of the bars. And I'd be walking past going, hey, how you going? And they'd be like, hey. I thought these guys could eat me in between a Subway sandwich. And as I'm walking through getting into the compound, we go into this church service, 500 prisoners, not one prison guard. And when I went in there, there was such an atmosphere of the presence of God. Prisoners that had tattoos on their faces, big monster guys that looked like they could rip your arms off and smack you around with your own hands. You know, were crying and weeping under the presence of God because they'd had a transformation. This is the most amazing thing. We sat down with a couple of the prisoners and they said this, we're so in love with God, they have a 24 hour, seven day a week prayer revival for revival for the world. Prisoners praying every single day for revival around the rest of the world. They even tithe on the gifts that they're given by their family outside the prison. They tithe on them, they put them into a holding cell and get this, when they hear about prison guards that are struggling with finances or struggling in different areas, they give them gifts. Can you imagine the impact it has on a prison guard getting given a gift by someone that has been committed for the rest of their life in prison? That is the most amazing thing. I remember leaving that service so impacted, so radically changed about what God can do inside the four walls of a prison, changing the moral decay, that as we began to leave, the head warden met up with us and he said this amazing thing. He said, what do you think of our prison? And I said, no, what do you think of your prison? And he said, it is truly amazing what God has done in this place. Let me tell you, God changes the moral decay. God changes the moral decay. When you become the salt of the earth, it changes the moral decay around you. People stop swearing, people stop cursing, people stop using the name of Jesus Christ. And it's not because of anything that you've said, it is because you're being the salt of the earth and you are preserving moral decay. Number one, salt creates thirst. Number two, it brings out the flavor of life. Number three, it preserves. You know, there are so many other reasons why I believe Jesus called us to be the salt of the earth. There's healing. It's got medicinal properties. Salt had great value back in those days. But I believe that the number one reason why Jesus called us to be the salt of the earth is this reason. Salt has to come into contact for it to have an effect. 
See, let me tell you, friends, if you never taste salt, it'll never make you thirsty. If you don't put salt on your food, it'll never bring out the flavor of the food. If you don't press it up against anything and rub it and make it in contact, it won't preserve anything. I believe the greatest reason why Jesus called us to be the salt of the earth is because we are called to get into contact, make contact, rub shoulders with the lost, the dying and the hurting in this world. That is the reason. Jesus was the greatest example of this. He was always with people, not separate, not just standing in a pulpit, not just preaching the word, but living the word, making his actions speak louder than his words. I love what St. Francis of Assisi said. He said, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. In other words, if your words don't back up your actions, it's no point you opening up your mouth. See, Matthew 28 verse 19 says this, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always. When Jesus said, and lo, I'm with you always, he wasn't speaking to an Asian disciple. He meant my presence goes with you. He said, if you want my presence to go with you, then you need to go out into the world. I love what one man said. Two thirds of God's name is go. The last third is, duh. If we don't go out where God is, how are God, where the people are, how are they ever going to come to know? See, Jesus told us to go. We keep on telling people to come. Most people are too afraid to walk into a church building at this point. They think the walls are going to fall down. They think everybody's going to know that a sinner's in the house. We've got to go out where the people are. Now, that doesn't mean we have to go to nightclubs or places like that. People don't live inside nightclubs. They do come out. But what about the person at the petrol station? What about the person in your workplace? What about the person in your family? What about the person in your university? What about the person in your high school? Whatever it is, wherever you are, the demographic that you live in, that's where we're supposed to be. Jesus wants us to be the salt of the earth. We are called to share the gospel at every opportunity, not just by what we say, but by who we are. The greatest illustration I've ever heard of the gospel being portrayed is this. I remember reading a story, and it impacts me still to this day, of a mum walking home with her daughter after church on a Sunday morning. And her daughter turned around and said, Mommy, I need to ask you a question. She goes, didn't you tell me that God is so big that the world can't contain him? She goes, that's why, baby, I told you that. She goes, didn't you tell me God is so massive that planet Earth is his footstool? She goes, that's right, baby, he's a big God, he's big. She goes, didn't you tell me that he's so huge that I can't see the beginning and the end of him? He's eternal. She goes, that's right, baby. I told you, God is massive. He's huge. She goes, well, mommy, I'm a little confused. She goes, why why is that, baby? And she said, because today in Sunday school, the Sunday school teacher told me that God lives inside of me. And she goes, well, that's right. She goes, well, mommy, I need you to answer this question for me because I'm confused. She said, if God is so big that the world can't contain him, if God is so huge that planet Earth is his footstool, If God is so massive that I can't see the beginning and the end of him, yet he lives inside of me, shouldn't people see him coming out of me? Let me tell you, friends, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is allowing God to so infill you that you can't help but have him come out of you wherever you are. I love what the rest of the text says. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, What is it good for? It's good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You know, even as you've been listening to this lesson, you may be thinking, well, as you begin to speak, there was a time where I used to create thirst. There was a time where I used to uh, stir up life. I used to bring out the flavor of life. There might have even been a time where you changed the moral decay. But right now you feel like you've lost your saltiness. What does that mean? Does it mean I'm good for nothing? No, you need to understand. Back in those days when they sold salt in the marketplace, what would happen is the marketeer would come with his big barrel of salt or his sack of salt and then they would open it up and and they would begin to sell during the course of the day. And buyers would come past and they would scoop up the salt and put it in their bags or their carry pouches and they would weigh it and they'd pay by measure. But what would happen during the course of the day is the sun would begin to beat down on that sack of salt or that barrel of salt and the top layer would begin to crystallize because the sun was beating out on it during the day. But what the owner of the salt would do is he would gently come 
and he would scrape around the surface and then he would flick off the outer layer and it would be trampled by the buyers of the salt during the course of the day. But underneath was still good salt. And you may be listening to this right now and thinking, well, I've lost my saltiness. Well, let me tell you, my friend, there is still a great hope for you. Because God, in his great mercy, God in his great uh, uh, power can come and just remove that outer layer. Maybe you've been hurt by a past experience. Maybe something happened when you began to share your faith with someone that hurt you so bad that it's closed you up and you feel like there's an outer shell of your life. Maybe it's been rejection. Maybe family members have said stuff. Maybe whatever circumstance it is, God knows what it is and it's tried to create a shell around your life and stop you from being the salt of the earth. Well, I've got good news for you today. Just by one prayer, just by one commitment to God, asking God, I want you to take away the outer shell. I don't want to live with this shell over my life. I want to be the salt of the earth again. He can simply do that. He can simply do that, just removing it. And right now, I just want to pray before we finish this session that God would, in fact, do that in your life. Let's pray. Father, I just pray right now in your awesome and wonderful son's name that you would come down by the power of your Holy Spirit and remove whatever it is that has come into our life that has created a shell over us, which has stopped us from being the salt of the earth. God, be it rejection, be it abuse, be it a hurt, whatever it is, be it fear. Lord God, we will not live under those circumstances anymore. So I pray right now, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Remove that shell. We want to be the salt of the earth again. We want to be people that create a thirst in people's lives. We want to be a people that bring out the flavor of life, that show people what real Christianity is. We want to be a people that preserve the moral decay, Lord God. Father, we ask this now in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So as we finish today, salt creates thirst. Salt brings out the flavor. Salt preserves. And salt needs to come into contact to have a great effect. I want to ask you these questions that I want you to reflect on. How can you become more like salt? Question two. What influence are you having on the community right now? And the last question I want you to think about is what do you need to improve on to become more the salt of the earth.